And, uh, and then, oh, we have Homeland Security over here already. Uh, you know, I don't care if you put it up for free, don't sell it. That's all I ask. All right. According to your uh, guidebook, I'm supposed to talk about uh, punk as a political platform and how to mobilize people into action. Which sort of seems like it does that automatically, in a way, even in the age of uh, dippy-ass pop punk taking over so much of mainstream culture with, you know, eagles with loud guitars and stupid boy girly poo lyrics and stuff, but uh, that wasn't what got me into it. But to rewind a little bit, um, sometimes people talk about the punk movement and oh, all my clients are the punk movement. Punk is not a movement. It's rebel culture, entertainment, fashion, education, but a movement is, to me, it's something more directly political where you're working with all different kinds of people and you have your eyes on the same prize. You know, be it uh, ending of nuclear plants or getting states of Texas and Arizona to quit selling so many guns to Mexican cartels for them to take home and then kill people there with, which they were talking about earlier. You know, that, that, that's an eye on the prize, but what is the prize of a punk movement? More punk? I mean, I think we've succeeded on that part. It's, it's, it just depends on, on how you use it. And in the beginning, punk was, you know, it, it, it wasn't just cool music, it was a prank, basically, against everything that was just apathetic and boring and stupid about the 70s, the music in particular. Because at that point, we, because the baby boomers had gotten older and we were a little younger, there wasn't as many of us, we were all supposed to embrace soft rock, adult rock, singer-songwriters, the deep lyrical meaning of, I'll mention them again, the Eagles or Fleetwood Mac, long before Tipper Gore and Bill Clinton were dancing around at the Democratic Convention to Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Something drastic had to be done, and it was. And not all the early punk bands were political. Some were even kind of conservative, like Johnny Ramone, for example. But it was the music that was the prank and breaking down barriers. And the, the main thing that it had in common was that with all the adult rock and the arena rock and dumbass platform shoes and everything else, the spirit of rock and roll, so to speak, had been lost. You know, the spirit that gave us little Richard and the cool 50s and rockabilly stuff all the way up through the garage era and the Stooges and everything else. They wanted nothing to do with that, basically. No, you want Crosby, Stills, and Nash. That's what you want. No, that's not what we want. And uh, so anyway, that, that, that to me is why punk's more of a culture than a movement. One thing, I guess I put this next on my little page, for people who are making the music and everything. I, I, one thing I think was that, 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 that's good about people, you know, there's a lot of people who are really young here, you know, probably my age or younger when Dead Kennedy started. Dead Kennedy started when I was 19, and I just lucked out that I moved to San Francisco and they had all ages shows, which they didn't in New York at the time. But if you really want to make your band special, and go beyond the beyond and take it somewhere else, it helps to push yourself to another level, both lyrically and musically. And I don't just necessarily mean getting the chops down better, that helps too, but trying to find a way, or should I say blunder into a way, to not sound like every other band. I mean, in the early days, they called it old school, there wasn't any goddamn school. We were burning down the school. We were blowing up the school. I'm very proud to have been a part of burning down the Hotel California. <laughs> but, but what it also meant is people had to draw influences from the roots of the roots, getting their records out of thrift stores. A lot of it was the one Stooges fan in their town moving to a bigger city and finding other ones. Velvet Underground, some of us were into Captain Beefheart, you go to people's houses and parties, see what 
they, they listened to it. A lot of the stuff just they pulled out of thrift stores, 60s garage records. If there was a, a Phil Spector Ronettes original or something, it would be in some punk's bedroom or something, just grasping for some Johnny Cash, too. Just something that was more direct and less bogus. James Brown, as well. And what I'm getting at here is sometimes people get really surprised when I tell them that you know, some of my musical inspirations are not political musicians. You know, there's music and the spirit and the power of music. It doesn't necessarily have to be separate, but you can add to it from all kinds of other areas. I mean, I doubt I'd get very far if I had to try to have a politi progressive political discussion with Jerry Lee Lewis, for example. But I can tell immediately if a punk band ain't got no Jerry Lee in them. You know, there is something that isn't there if they haven't had that kind of rock and roll soul and background, so to speak. And in my case, I go all over the map, and that's why a lot of my stuff doesn't sound like a lot of other people's stuff, or that's what I try for anyways, because always into psychedelic music, crowd rock, Hawkwind is the second biggest band to me from teenage years and the Stooges and everything. So. And then I then I'd start uh, when I started finally getting seven inches, I'd look for say '60s garage originals, '60s punk originals in the thrift stores, and accidentally buy surf instrumental records. And decided I liked those too. It was kind of a secret weapon of Dead Kennedy. So I mean, was listening to that then, and so I looked for more surf instrumental records, and I'd blunder into rockabilly records. I wanted more of those, so I'd blunder into rhythm and blues. You know, back when R&B meant rhythm and blues instead of what they call it now, when it has no rhythm or blues in it. Kind of like the dumbing down of industrial music or the corporate end of punk, even. Where even boy bands look like Sid Vicious now, and so do secretaries in some cases. <laughs> but anyway, always had a uh, soft spot in my heart for uh, pranks and direct action, mostly of the non-violent kind, the mouse biting the elephant, slowing down the machine. And the coolest part is anybody can do it. Even anybody, one person can do it without having to go to meetings and argue about anarchy all night or go get your heads cracked by the police or whatever. One of the ones I keep wondering if people are gonna bring back, and was one when things were going on in England just now, I was like, wait a minute, whatever happened to you know, you don't like these chains and everything. What happened to lock gluing? Woo! Woo! Liquid Ow! steel, liquid epoxy, if they've got anywhere. cameras now, wear Mickey Mouse masks, squirt by. And then it takes them hours of sawing into their own building to get it open the next day. There was an old uh, British scene, what was the name of that thing? I think they were called Pigs for Slaughter. In about 1980, I opened it up and they were calling for a nationwide day of lock gluing against McDonald's. <laughs> Which I thought might be a very interesting approach. Something a little less vandalism-like than that has started up in England. This is an example of direct action pranks doing a lot of good. Just like here, they're in for a round of deliberately cruel budget cuts of social services and health and cutting off younger people, especially poor younger people's ability to go to school and everything. You know, you're in the ghetto now, you're going to stay there forever until you migrate back to the country that your grandparents came from or something like that. And so a group of people who, as I understand it, they didn't all know each other, and some of them have never been to a demonstration in their lives, found each other on the internet and uh, came together at a cafe and started something called UK Uncut. You know, not the budget cuts, we'll uncut it. And their point being that uh, Prime Minister, that, that preppy twit guy they've got now named David Cameron, uh, he had something like seven billion pounds of budget cuts. And I don't know whether that was for the whole country, just one area. And they contrasted it with a company called Vodafone, who I keep getting mixed up with Verizon because they're the same kind of really dominant phone and tech company, had paid 
six billion pounds in taxes, which was almost the entire amount of the budget cuts, while Cameron was patting their CEO on the head for what a great business leader he was, they decided, okay, let's go get Vodafone. Let's block one of their main retail stores on Oxford Street in London on Saturday. The media noticed this. It got all kinds of news coverage. And before they knew it, the other people calling themselves UK Uncut were attacking Vodafone stores all over England. That was cool. 